First of all, I would like to thank um, Ona and Anupam for putting this conference together. Um, as everyone, I'm very sorry of the circumstances of the fact that I cannot come and visit India. This would have been my first time. France is the fifth largest um, a most infected country in the world, so it's probably a good, uh, good news for you that I'm not around, but anyway. So, um, I was supposed to give three lectures, which I wanted to do on Blackboard, but because I've moved to this online format, I've moved also to slides. Um, nevertheless, I'm very happy to try and um, share computations when, um, when need be. The first talk, the talk of today, will be about motility regulation and self-organization in active matter. And the second talk, um, I think on Friday, will be about uh, anomalous mechanics in active systems. <clears throat> and I don't know exactly where I will stop today, but I think I'll probably be able to, to, to finish. Please feel free to interrupt and ask questions, especially because I don't see you. I cannot see the level of understanding um, in your eyes, and I will need your feedback. Okay. So before I dive into um, active matter, I would like to um, advocate and explain why, as a StatMec person, I'm interested in that question. To do that, um, the easiest is to start from you know, what is equilibrium statistical mechanics, to contrast with active matter. So the standard framework of equilibrium um, active, uh, equilibrium dynamics is, is described on the screen. You see uh, a very large system, a macroscopic system, in contact with an even larger thermostat. And we assume that a very chaotic dynamic in the thermostat, through energy exchange with the system, will drive the letter to a thermal equilibrium. And there are really two <clears throat> main um, things we know about equilibrium systems, which are really defining features. The first one is that because of the very particular type of dynamics it is endowed um, of, um, we know the steady state. And we know that the steady state of the system is given by the Boltzmann distribution, meaning that if I show you a system and I tell you it is in equilibrium, you know that the probability to observe a given configuration of the system will be given by the Boltzmann weight, exponential minus beta, the energy of the configuration. The second thing um, that uh, you know in equilibrium is that if you start arbitrarily far from equilibrium, you will have an irreversible dynamics that would drive you to, to equilibrium. But once you're there, there is a time reversal symmetry and you cannot distinguish an error of time anymore. So these are the defining features of equilibrium statistical mechanics. And um, now we want to move to active matter and so we want to enter the realm of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. And as you can hear in its name, non-equilibrium physics is not a positive definition, it's a negative one. And to paraphrase Ulam, um, we could say that non-equilibrium physics is like non-elephant biology. So what does it mean? If you take an ant, a tree, and a theoretical physicist, the three biological entities are part of the non-elephant non world. But they are part of this world in so different ways that the probability that you find a single unifying theory that has a lot of relevant stuff to say about each of these systems is very small. And the same is true about non equilibrium physics. You can be out of equilibrium in many different ways. For instance, you can have no steady state. Or you can have a steady state, but it's not described by a Boltzmann weight. Or you can have a steady state accidentally described by a Boltzmann weight, but without a time reversal symmetry. And all these ways of being out of equilibrium would be so different that they would naturally lead to very different type of physics and to different type of theory if you wanted to describe them. And if you look at what people have been doing, um, I would say most successfully out of equilibrium, is basically identifying coherent subclasses and try to say something smart and useful about them. So some examples are shown in, in, these, um, in these images. On the left, you have glasses which have system will have an equilibrium dynamics. They have a steady state that would be described by a Boltzmann uh, weight, but essentially the dynamics is so slow that they never reach the steady state. In, in the middle, you have uh, the Wikipedia example of the Rayleigh-Bénard experiment, um, in which you have a fluid whose Borg dynamics would uh, relax toward equilibrium, 
but which is driven out of equilibrium by your heat gradients. And, and hence, we'll reach a steady state which is maintained out of equilibrium because you inject energy at the boundaries. And finally, on the right here, you have um, an image taken from a marathon, which is a good example of what active matter here it is. It's a system comprising many units in which each individual unit is itself a non-equilibrium driven system. And this is the subclass on which um, I will focus today. So um, the standard definition you find of active materials is that active systems comprise large assembly of units which are able to dissipate energy to exert forces on their environment, which give them a drive out of equilibrium at the microscopic individual level. These make the system strongly out of equilibrium system and um, endow them with fundamentally new physics and new phenomenologies which we don't see in equilibrium. Um, now, 10 years ago, if you would enter any talk on active matter, the standard image you would see is flock of birds, school of fish, herd of animals, maybe swimming bacteria, but everything will be in the biological world. And, and really, initially, the main reason why people were excited by this field was because of um, its biological relevance. The main reason why people like me, like physical physicists, got excited was because um, in addition to this biological relevance, suddenly you had a whole wealth of new dynamical phenomenology like collective motion that you can see on the screen. Over the past 10 years, we've really changed paradigm in, in active matter. Uh, and most of the time when you open active matter papers, that's what you see. Um, and these are active systems, man-made, um, which have been, um, which are synthetic and don't rely on bi biological ingredients. So you can have um, clusters of separable colloids on the left, which are driven by electric fields. Uh, in the center, you have related system in which you can see a solitonic wave move through the system. On the right, you have separable droplets that const constantly form uh, filaments, which are also breaking. And this, this, this um, ability that we had to build new synthetic systems is very important because it means that there is now a pathway towards active soft materials. And if you think about the impact that um, passive equilibrium soft matter had on industry in the 20th century, from your toothpaste, which is a suspension of glass beads, to the LCD screen of your phone, um, it's pretty clear that if we were able to control and harness active soft material in the same way we do passive soft materials, we'll have a new range of, of material science that will be offered to us. So, um, from a more physicky or stat making point um, of view, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes in defining more precisely what is, for me, a standard active system. So, um, to do that, again, I will contrast with the standard equilibrium situation. On this slide, you can see a silica bead, which is immersed in water and which is moving to the right at some speed v. If you want to write its dynamics, it's a classical object, so essentially you write Newton's law. So just below the figure, you can see the dynamics. The mass times the acceleration is equal to the sum of the external forces. So first force could be the minus the gradient of an external potential. For instance, it could be gravity or it could be an optical tweezer. And then this colloid is interacting with the fluid that surrounds it. And the interaction between the fluid molecules and the, the colloidal particle are typically split between two terms. You have a first term, which is minus gamma V, which is the mean force that the fluid molecule exerts on the colloid. And this mean force, on average, opposes motion. It lowers the kinetic energy of the colloid, and it's a dissipative force. It's called the drag force. And it's typically characterized by some parameter gamma, that depends on the geometry of the object and the property of the fluid. But that's only half the story. That's what happens on average. Around this average, you have fluctuations. And these fluctuations are represented by this term in red, root to gamma kT times eta, where eta is a Gaussian white noise. And these fluctuations around the average force exerted by the fluid molecules, on average, inject energy 
into the system. And as you can see, um, the variance of this force um, is 2 gamma kT, and is so related to the scale of the dissipation. And this is called the celebrated fluctuation dissipation theorem, which tells you that the colloid, because it's in um, and the fluid at equilibrium, because the injection and dissipation of energy come from the same equilibrated fluids, they are not completely disconnected. There is a fundamental relation between the two of them, and this will ensure that the dynamics relax towards the Boltzmann steady state. Now, if you want to move to active matter, you can look at almost the same situation, but you replace the colloids by a bacterium. So if you have a bacterium in the fluid and you write um, the Newton's law, the three same terms will be present. You can still have external forces, you will still have some dissipation, and you will still have some injection of energy because of the fluctuation from, from the fluid. However, in addition, and the main reason why this system is called an active system, is because the bacterium is able to consume some internal source of energy, ATP, to power a proton pump that will make its flagella rotate, it will thus exert a force on the fluid and will experience the reaction force, which I've called Fp times U of theta. So if I look into my Newton um, equation, I now have a new term, which also injects energy and average. And in doing so, I've disconnected the injection of energy into the system from the dissipation. And this imbalance between injection and dissipation will generically drive the system out of equilibrium. So, if you look um, in the literature into most paper, uh, and you look at active matter models, typically you don't see this complicated Newton equation because inertia at the scale of most of the active particles we know how to build is irrelevant. So, typically this mv dot would be replaced by zero. And the second thing is that you rarely consider both translational diffusion and self repulsion force. You take these two terms in red and you package them into you know, an effective noise eta tilde. And you could wonder whether at this level you've recovered an effective equilibrium Langevin dynamics. And the answer is still no, because typically this noise eta tilde will have time correlation, which are not matched by time correlation in the dissipation. And so you have a difference between the memory kernels of the dissipation and the injection of energy that will drive the system out of equilibrium. So this is, in a way, a very formal and fundamental way of defining active materials at the microscopic level, and that's the one that I like most. Now, um, I will push a little bit more this example of bacteria, because they will be one of the protagonists of this talk, uh, and I would like to tell you a bit more about their dynamics. So bacteria have been studied for a very long time. They're very important in, in, um, in biology. Uh, in physics, it's really the second half of the, of the 20th century during which people started to look at them a lot. And there are fundamental works by, uh, similar works by, uh, in the lab of Howard Berg, who characterize in detail the motion of uh, run entomal bacteria like Escherichia coli. So you can see here on the right um, an, an electron microscopy picture of Escherichia coli. Typical size of the cell body is a micrometer, wide and two micrometer long. You can see that it has several flagella that emerge on the right from cell body that it uses to swim. Now, on the top, um, you can see a trajectory which was recorded experimentally um, by Berg and Braun using a 3D um, tracking microscope. And you can see that this dynamics comprises um, typically two parts. You have runs in straight line, so long time of almost ballistic motion, and you have sudden reorientation that we call tumble, in which bacteria pick a new direction. So the standard picture, which is a bit challenged these days, but has a hold for a number of years, is that um, the, um, going from a running phase to a tumbling phase is essentially a Poisson process that happens at a constant rate alpha. So if I want to make a simple model of this trajectory um, on the top left, I can draw the, tra the trajectory on the top right, which is a typical realization of the process I'm describing at the bottom. On the bacterium can be in two phases. On the left, it is in a run phase in which it's moving almost straight at some speed v. And then at a constant rate alpha, it can enter a tumbling phase in which it's randomizing its direction. And it will resume swimming at a swimming rate beta. Uh, 
So the tumbling rate alpha and the swimming rate beta will come back frequently in the talk, and I'll try to, to uh, remind what they are as frequently as I can. In terms of number, a bacterium covers typically 20 times, 10 to 20 times its size per second. It changes direction every second, and the duration of the tumble is super, super short, a tenth of a second. So often people assume that the tumbles are instantaneous. Now, um, as I told you, bacteria are not the only systems um, which um, can be active, and, and not all active systems are biological. And here on this slide, um, you can see a cartoon of what we call self-propelled colloids. So, for instance, here I'm describing what we call genus colloids, which are colloids with two different phases, which are with asymmetric coating. So, typically, and here I'm thinking about systems which have been developed in Lyon uh, in the group of Cécile Cotin-Bison, you have a um, LaTeX bead with one half covered in platinum in red. So, why do you cover them in platinum? Because then you can induce what is called self-diffusophoresis. So you take these colloids, which would be at this stage purely passive, and you immerse them in hydrogen peroxide. Now it turns out that platinum catalyzes the transmutation of hydrogen peroxide into oxygen plus water. So when you put hydrogen peroxide around this particle, you create a gradient of concentration around the colloids. Because hydrogen peroxide interacts in a different way with platinum and with LaTeX, there is a pressure gradient along the colloid, and the colloid becomes self-propelled. So there is some debate about the precise mechanism, about how this guy works. But in practice, the modeling is as follows. You have a Langevin equation, and here I'm writing an overdumped Langevin equation, so I've dropped out the noise, in which the velocity r dot of t of my particle is a sum of a self-proportion term, V u of theta, where u of theta is a unit vector which here in 2D is pointing along the angle theta, plus some translational diffusion, root 2D t eta. And then if you look at the dynamics of um, the angle theta of t, it's doing a continuous random walk. So basically the big difference between the bacterium here, which on the top right is doing this sudden orientation, and these colloids, is that if you look at the dynamics, and here I'm showing you a movie, you will see that uh, the motion of this colloid is smooth. So here they're not moving. These guys are light controlled. And when you turn on light, you see that they become self-propelled, but that the reorientation are continuous. So these colloids are a bit different um, than the, the genus colloid I've told you. You may see these black dots. These black dots are small cubes of hematite, which is an iron oxide that only catalyzes the transmutation of hydrogen peroxide when you shed blue light on it. So when the light is off, this guy is essentially not moving. And when you turn on the light, they start um, being self-propelled. So you have light-controlled active particles, um, and you can actually have now, people have developed many other types of self-propelled colloids. If you look at numbers, these guys, they are not as good as bacteria. They swim a bit slower. So here you have one micrometer per second. Translational diffusion is small, um, and if you look at the large-scale diffusivity, because of the random, the persistent random work they're doing, it's typically one order of magnitude faster than just the passive, um, the passive one. So now here I've shown you a movie of um, you know, very dilute uh, self-propelled colloid. I could show you a movie of very dilute self-propelled bacteria. What I want to go to today is more about um, dense interacting suspension of self propelled particles, and I want to speak about their, their self-organization. So as I told you a few slides um, ago, uh, we're very excited by active matter because we see all this fancy phenomenology that we don't see in, um, in equilibrium physics. And so it's cool because we have something new. However, uh, what we've lost by working with um, non equilibrium systems is a generic knowledge, and a priori knowledge, of their steady state. So if you're an experimentalist working on separable particles and you go around and you ask theoretician colleagues, what could I do, what could I engineer as um, interactions to get this or that type of collective behavior, the answer is we don't know a priori because we don't have a Boltzmann weight that guides our intuition. So let me give you an example. Um, 
you know, equilibrium physics, as I told you, give you an intuition based on Boltzmann weights. And if you look at the liquid gas phase transition, if you have colloidal particles and you want to implement a liquid gas phase transition, you know what you have to do. What you have to do is simply to engineer attractive interactions. Why? Because the steady state is selected by a competition between entropy and energy. You know that entropy will favor disorder, that if you have attractive interactions, energy will favor cohesion. When you lower the temperature, the energy will win over the entropy, and you will get a transition from a dilute gas to a dense liquid with coexistence if you're in the equilibrium ensemble. If you take an active system and I ask you what should I build as interactions to get a liquid phase transition, you don't know the answer a priori. You could imagine that what you need is even stronger attractive forces that will beat self-propulsion, and as you will see in this talk, that's not the most efficient way to go. So the fact that we don't have a generic formula for steady-state distributions means that we have a little basis upon which to build intuition, and that if you want to engineer active materials, you have very few guiding principles. So what I would like to show you today is that there is one exception to this uh, sad um, but stimulating comment. It's motility control. So uh, I will consider the two types of self-propelled particles I've introduced so far, run and tumble particles on the left, active run and particles on the right. The main differences will be the orientation mechanisms. Um, there are other classes of active particles, like active einstein ullenbeck particles, what I will introduce also apply to them generically. And what I would like to convince you is that we understand very well how controlling the property of the velocity can be used to control the steady state. So um, to do that, I will first work in the simplest of cases in which I have non-interacting particles, but which have a non-homogeneous speed V of R. So maybe in the left half of the system, the, the particles are slower than the right half of the system. Then I will discuss what is called quorum sensing interactions, which is something commonly seen in biology, in which either because you know, cells or bacteria compete for food, or because they secrete uh, signaling molecules which can then be detected, you have active particles whose statistics depend on the local density of their peer. So for instance, maybe you go faster or slower if you have lots or few people around you. And um, the last part of my talk will be basically applications of these quorum sensing interactions to bacterial pattern formation, and then I will go back to some experiments that uh, my collaborators carried out. Okay, so um, let's start with position-dependent self-propulsion speed. And please feel free to ask questions, interrupt me if, if there are things which are not clear. So here on the top, I've written down the master equation for the probability density P of R theta, um, which is the probability of finding an active particle at position R going in direction Hello? theta. Hello? Yeah, is, yes? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I had a question actually. Yes? So instead of uh, uh, velocity depending on position, can we have uh, rates depend on position that alpha and beta? Yes. Yes, so actually everything I will say is actually very generic and um, having a slowdown of the velocity of an, or an increase of the tumbling rate or decrease of the swimming rate will be equivalent. Now there is something which is interesting and it's a, a mistake which has been made by a number of having a non-uniform self-propulsion speed was doing lots of fancy things, which I will now discuss, while having a specially dependent tumbling rate wouldn't do anything. And this is true if you have instantaneous tumbles. As soon as you take into account the fact that you have finite duration tumbles, you have a much richer physics. And I'll probably come back to that a bit later on. But now, for now, I'm just describing the simplest case, which is the, the VFR case. So if you write the master equation for this case, um, what you have is that the time derivative of the probability of finding a particle at position R going to theta is made up of two terms. First, you have a probability-conserving term minus divergence 
of a current, this current being the speed times u of theta times p of r theta. And this is just saying that if you move into direction u of theta, you add vector probability as you move. That's not, nothing surprising there. Then you have this second term in magenta plus theta p, where theta is a linear operator that deals with the randomization of orientation. So for instance, if you have rotational diffusion for active Brownian particles, ABPs, theta would just be dr times Laplacian of theta. If you had um, random tumble particle, theta applied to p would be minus alpha p, which is a lost term. You were the good position, going the good direction, but you tumble and go away from the good direction, plus a gain term that would be the integral over theta prime times the rate at which you go from theta prime to theta, which would be alpha over 2 pi, times p of r and theta prime. Now, if you look at, this, if you look at the steady state of um, this system, the first thing you can understand is that if you have a randomization of the orientation, any isotropic function will be such that theta times f of r would be zero. So if you have a Laplacian on theta that acts on a function of r, you get zero immediately. And if you look on the right hand side, if you integrate p of r theta prime and there is no dependent on theta, you just get a factor of 2 pi and the two terms balance. So then if you go back to the first equation and you try to find a steady state, what you need is simply that the divergence of v of r, u of theta, p of r is zero. And a simple way of getting that is to find p of r proportional to 1 over v. So what this tells you is that um, bacteria accumulate where they go slower, which is something very intuitive. If you, you know, steady state distribution is just measuring the average time you spend somewhere. If you go slower somewhere, you spend more time there. Again, I could have done this uh, computation with alpha of r and beta of r, and I would have had a slightly different expression, but which again um, would have led to the same result that if I spend more time swimming somewhere because my tumbling rate is slower, my swimming rate is larger, my probability uh, will be smaller in this place. You can also do these computations by, added, by adding perturbatively translational diffusion. You find that this changes quantitatively the steady state distribution, but qualitatively the, the physics is the same. You accumulate or you go slower. So these are simple computations that were obtained first uh, for run and bacteria by Schnitzer and generalized to other type of uh, active particles by us more recently. There have also been some experiments uh, with bacteria, which have checked these predictions. So one thing which is interesting with bacteria is that you can use a protein called proteorhodopsin, which is like a solar panel for bacteria. Um, it basically uh, uses light to power proton pump. So what you can do is you can remove the standard proton pump of bacterium and in the, instead put proton pump, which are only controlled by uh, proteorhodopsin, so that your bacteria only swim when you shed light on them, and if you shed more light, they swim faster. Um, doing that, you can check quantitatively that indeed the steady state distribution is proportional to 1 over v, which is a you know, quantitative check in an experimental system that our theoretical prediction works, which means that we can control these systems very efficiently. And then you can play a fun game. You can use uh, some beamer to vide your project a light pattern on the bacteria, and then you can measure the steady state distribution. And what you see here are not just bad image of a smiley face or, or the Joconda. What you see here is really a steady state distribution of, of bacterial density. And you can also do that dynamically. So for instance, here you start from the face of Einstein by showing a picture of Einstein. Then suddenly you show a picture of Darwin. And as you see, the bacteria reorient, reorganize, and the steady state goes from uh, Einstein phase to, to Darwin phase. As um, was mentioned earlier, uh, the accumulation can be triggered by VFR, but it can also be triggered by having alpha far or beta far in equivalent ways. So there are many ways of slowing down, and they are largely lead to, to um, quantitative differences, but qualitatively similar features. Okay, now I would like to move to interactions because I really want to talk about self-organization. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the top, the pathway of interactions I want to discuss is uh, quorum sensing.
So this is something that um, exists generically in nature that will also be present in um, synthetic system when you have competition for fuel. And the idea is that you have regulation of motility by local density. So through this talk, I will discuss a lot a type of bacterium in which um, the tumbling rate and the swimming rate, so the rate at which you go from swimming to, to not swimming, are controlled by density. This is a bacter strain, bacterial strain which has been developed in the lab of um, John Dong Huang. Uh, and this, these are, this is someone who is an expert in synthetic biology. So what they do is they take a, um, a bacterium, and here on the left, this uh, gray uh, ovoid shape is a cartoon of a bacterium. And you put two plasmids, so small piece of DNA in the bacterium. You have a first gene that codes for a signaling molecule, which is called AHL, which will be transported outside the cell and diffused in the environment. Now, this molecule, once in the environment, can also come back in the cell, where it will go, interact with some other protein, and regulate the expression of some gene. And here, the key player is someone called Kizi. Kizi is a gene which codes for protein, who is responsible for making um, tumbling cell resume swimming. So if you don't have Kizi, you're stopped. If you have Kizi, a lot of it, you're smooth swimming. And so if you engineer this system, where you have a lot of bacteria, you'll have a lot of AHL. Where you have a lot of AHL, you'll have a lot, you will uh, repress Kizi, so you will not have Kizi. And so the result is that bacteria will tend to stop at high density. Conversely, at low density, they'll be happy and they will be swimming. So on the right, what you have is a measure of a large scale diffusivity, which as I told you is mostly due to swimming, versus the cell density. What you can see is that at low cell density, the relative diffusivity is the same as without interactions, so the relative diffusive coefficient is 1. And as the density increases, there is a sharp decrease of the cell density. So here, there are many ways of, of modeling this type of experiments. Um, and the one I'm, I'm choosing here is deliberately not the one relevant for these experiments, is by taking a model of separable particles in which the velocity is a slightly non-local function of um, the local density of, of, of particles. So you would have a dynamics that would be Ri dot is V of rho tilde of Ri times U of theta, where rho tilde of Ri is an effective density measured by the bacteria. So for instance, it could be the convolution of the green function of the dynamics of the signaling molecule with the real density. And then you have rho tilde of r, which is the integral, the r prime of k of r minus r prime or of r prime, Hello? where k of r is Hello? typically a bell shaped kernel. Yes? Yeah, the Gin's function of which dynamics did you say? So imagine, imagine you, you write down the dynamics for this AHL molecule. Okay? Uh, maybe I can, up, I can go up on this. You should be able to see my hands. So imagine that you have your bacteria here which uh, have a dynamics which is now a function of C of R, where C of R is the concentration of the AHL molecule. If I write down generically a dynamics for C, I would have something like C times D Laplacian C. This molecule is unstable, so it would be degraded. So you would have minus gamma times C. And then you would have some um, production of, um, of C by... Uh, the, by, the, by the bacteria. Now here, I can um, either solve this dynamics and get a green function, do a fast variable treatment on C, but basically if I, um, if I do a fast variable dynamics on C, what I would get is that C is simply G star rho, where G is the green function uh, that would satisfy the Laplacian uh, G minus gamma G is equal to delta of R. Okay? Now, um, I would basically get that uh, C is, is like that. And so if I inject it back in here, I would get that rho dot is V of what I call the rho tilde of R with rho tilde of R oops, maybe, up, rho tilde of R being G 
star row. So that's one way of justifying why would you you would look at um, something like that, but also other ways which I will discuss in a minute. Can can you read when they made yeah. these computations or not? Yes, yes. Okay, thanks. So I'll go back to my slides. So we are back with the slides now. Can you see my slide? You can see your slides. Okay, good. So, um, so that's one way of explaining this type of shape, but that's also something that could be built in 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 in, in another way, which I'll describe in a minute. So, if you take a model like that, and here I'm discussing V of Rotilda, but you can also have alpha of Rotilda or beta of Rotilda. And you put that in the computer, and you take either your run and tumble particles or your active run and particles, and you make a simulation. This is what you see when you have a reduction of motility as the density increases. So here I'm showing simulations on the left of 10 to the 4 active run and particles, on the right run and particles. The color code is the density. Um, each, each, um, what you're seeing is really the dynamics of each particle here, and each of them is a smaller row. As what you can see is that very rapidly you have a linear instability that takes a homogeneous system into um, one with uh, clusters, so you have this dense cluster, and as time goes on, you have a slow coarsening that will take you towards a phase-separated system. One of the things which is interesting is that um, I've told you that it's active Ronian particles on the left, Ronian particles on the right, but you can see that from a macroscopic perspective, you don't really see any difference between the dynamics of the density field, and you have a form of universality in this system, that the microscopic orientation mechanism is not that important to describe um, the large-scale behavior. Okay, so can we understand why this decrease of the velocity as density increases leads to this phase separation? Okay, no, sorry, I just want to tell you first that this is something that uh, you can do in a computer, but you can also do it in experiments. This is a set of particles which have been developed in the group of Clemence Bechinger. So you can see here a picture of these genus colloids. Now here it's a bit of a different system. Um, this colloid is, is immersed in a water lutidine mixture at a temperature below the critical temperature. When you heat up the liquid, it will phase separate. Because this system is coated with gold uh, on the half and, and LaTeX on the other half, if you shed light on it, the solvent will be hotter close to the gold surface. The fluid will phase separate there. Again, you have a gradient of concentration, and this guy becomes self-propelled. And what you can see is that they have barely any uh, interactions, but you know, the, the small particles are just passive colloids, the big particles are the self-propelled colloids. Now, what uh, the group of Clemence Bechinger did was to build a feedback system in which you have a bunch of these guys swimming around, you record them, you compute the density, the local density around each of the colloids, and you change the light you send to this colloid specifically. So if the speed of the colloid is uniform, what you observe is uh, what you see on the left, which is um, the density field, the heat map of the density field of colloid, and basically you just see some density fluctuations. The, 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 the colloids are swimming around and exploring the space homogeneously. If, on the other hand, the light you send to a given colloid is a function of the density of colloid around this colloid, you get what you have on the right, which is basically a phase separation in the clustering. So you can implement this type of phase separation also in, uh, in an experiment. And in a way, you can see that as first a check that the theory is robust to realistic experimental condition. And also an interesting step in terms of engineering on active matter, because it means that these games we're playing in computers are not only you know, nice phase separation that that make people want to study, but they can be engineering pathways. OK, so can we understand this phase separation? Well, yes, um, and it basically is built on a feedback loop. So imagine that you have a system which is homogeneous, in which the speed in red of the bacteria is a function of the local density. If you have a fluctuation of density, which goes from Renault 
to rel tau r naught plus delta rho, then because of the interaction, you will have an equivalent fluctuation of the speed, which will be in phase opposition. But now you know that your system will want to relax towards a new homogeneous profile, which typically would be one over the velocity field. So you can take this velocity field, which has gone from V of rho naught to V of rho naught plus V prime of rho naught delta rho. And if I compute one over this guy, I get something like kappa, a constant over V of rho naught plus V prime of rho naught delta rho. I can expand this guy at the linear order in delta rho, and I get on the right rho naught minus rho naught V prime over V delta rho, where I've used that rho naught was one over V of rho naught, kappa over V of rho naught. So I've started from a fluctuation rho naught plus delta rho on the left, and I've arrived to a new fluctuation rho naught minus rho naught V prime over V delta rho. If this new fluctuation is larger than the initial fluctuation, I have a feedback loop that will amplify my fluctuation. That will trigger linear instability, and the quantitative criterion is V prime over V smaller than minus one over rho naught. And this will lead so this will in turn amplify the, the perturbation of velocity and so on and so forth. And it will lead to what we've called a motility-induced phase separation, MIPS. Now, um, this is the beginning of the story. This is telling you if you have a homogeneous profile in small fluctuations, if you have a speed that decays sufficiently rapidly as the density increases, you will be linearly unstable. But it doesn't tell you towards what you're linearly instable. Towards pattern, towards phase separation. If you have phase separation, can you predict a phase diagram, coexisting densities? So to answer these questions, uh, we have to remind what we do in equilibrium when we want to understand the liquid gas phase separation. There, we don't really work at the microscopic level and solve everything exactly. Even for the 2D Ising um, model, we don't know how to solve it analytically in the presence of a field. Rather, what we do is we work at the hydramic level. So if you have an equilibrium phase separating uh, dynamics, you can write down generically based on symmetries and, and, and um, uh, conservation laws, the large scale dynamics. So these systems are mass conserving. You're not creating or killing bacteria or in equilibrium, you're not conserving or killing colloids. So the dynamics typically will be a mass conservation dynamics, rho dot equal minus the divergence of the current. If you look at the expression of the current in equilibrium, this current would be minus a mobility times the gradient of the functional derivative of a free energy. And if you follow Ginzburg and Landau, you expand this free energy in gradient terms. So the free energy would be the integral over space of a free energy density, which would have a local part, f of rho of x, plus some second order gradient terms, plus higher order ingredients. If you want to understand the steady state, what you have to do is simplify, is simply find the profiles which extremalize, which minimize the free energy under some relevant constraint. So if you want to understand the emergence of a liquid gas phase separation, what you have to do is you have to take profiles which resemble the one depicted in the bottom left. So if I look through an interface along this black line, typically I would have a constant profile at a density rho g in the gas, then an interface and a constant profile at density rho in the liquid. I plug this type of profile in my free energy and I extremalize the free energy. Essentially, the interface has a cost which is sub-extensive, and so what I have to do is what is called the common tangent construction, meaning that as soon as um, my uh, free energy density, the local part F of rho, is non-convex, I will have a phase separation between two densities whose values are given by the intercept um, between a tangent and um, the free energy density. So you have to find the only supporting line that is tangent twice at two different densities to the local free energy densities. You read the intercept uh, with the horizontal axis, and that gives you the gas and the liquid densities. Mathematically, if you look at the fact that the, sl the slope is the same, amounts to the derivative of f with respect to rho being the same in the two phase, 
This is called um, the equality of chemical potential. And the fact that the red line has the same intercept with the vertical axis for the two points is the equality of pressure. One of the things that you can see in these dynamics is that J here is given by minus the gradient of something which is called a chemical potential. And you can see this instability is driven by a chemical potential. Now let's try to do the same thing for our non-equilibrium dynamics. So if you start from a microscopic um, model with random tumble or active Brownian particles which, in, which interact to come sensing, it turns out that with you know, up to a number of reasonable approximations, you can derive a hydramic description of this system. You have a mass conservation, so as you can see on the top left, the dynamics is again a mass conservation equation, rho dot equals the divergence of a current. And this current, because the system is isotropic, is typically, is typically written m times the divergence of g. So here g plays the same role as the chemical potential in the system. It turns out that you can compute explicitly g up to second order in gradient. It has a local part, j naught of rho, which is log of rho times v, or log of rho plus log of v. Log of rho is just something that you would get for any system. It's an entropic contribution. Log of v of rho is a term that comes from the interaction between the bacteria. Then you can also compute the second order terms in gradient, kappa of rho, and they have this complicated expression where sigma, I remind you, is the typical width of the kernel you've used to compute the non-local density locally. Now, unfortunately, uh, that's where the analogy with the equilibrium dynamic stops because this chemical potential, G of rho, you cannot write it as the derivative of the functional uh, with respect to the density field. And so you don't have a simple extremalization principle that will tell you how to get a phase separator, how to get the, the, the coexisting densities. It turned out that you could ask, well, maybe this guy is not the functional derivative of someone with respect to rho, but I could look for any change of variable r of rho, and I could ask whether this guy is the functional derivative of someone with respect to r. And it turns out that if you define a function r of rho through r prime of rho is 1 over kappa of rho, where kappa is the prefactor of the Laplacian in G, and you define a primitive, an integral of J naught with respect to R, and you call it phi, then the dynamics the, the, can be seen as driven by the functional derivative of a functional H with respect to this new variable R of rho. And if you look at the expression of H, you recover a standard Ginzburg-Landau expression, not with respect to the density field, but with respect to these new variables. At this stage, you're back in the game, and if you want to understand the, the steady state, you simply have to look whether phi of r has um, a non-convex part, and if it does, to find coexisting values of r, you just have to build a common tangent construction. If you do that for the system I've used to make these simulations here, in which I have my uh, system in which I have a velocity that depends on the density with these non-local kernels, and if I build the phase diagram um, as a function of the density and Vg over Vl, which are the ratio between the speeds in the low density limit and the high density limit, so it measures how fast you are in the dilute phase, you find the phase diagram which is really typical of MIPS. So I have here outside the red curve homogeneous system, and in between phase separation, the symbols are the coexisting densities measured in microscopic simulations in 1D, in 2D, on lattice, off lattice. The red curve is the parameter-free prediction using our um, generalized thermodynamics with this generalized uh, functional H of uh, phi of R. And in black, you have what you would find if you had treated J0 as an equilibrium chemical potential and forgotten about the fact that you don't have a true free energy. And so you can see that you can see a clear quantitative departure from the equilibrium um, predictions and an almost quantitative agreement with these, uh, with these descriptions. So 
we were here a bit worried about why we had an almost quantitative agreement and not a complete quantitative agreement. And what you can see here is that um, in the definition of our generalized free energy, we've used the mapping through a change of variable R of rho, which depends on kappa. And kappa, you can see, is the prefactor of the Laplacian in G, which means that the gradient terms in your free energy plays a role in controlling the binodals. That's not the case in equilibrium. And now you can see why our theory may fail, because in this system, we stop at second order in gradients, but this is just a gradient expansion. It's not a well-controlled approximation. So it could be that high order gradient should play also a term which is not captured our theory. So to test that, what we did is we went to work with um, mathematician colleagues and we worked on a lattice model for which we can construct, construct the hydraulic dynamics exactly. So we consider a lattice-based model in which you have alpha L sites with at most one particle per site. You have two types of particles, plus and minuses, the plus, and you have three types of moves. The first type of move is at rate D, you take the content of two neighboring sites and you exchange them, whatever is on the site. So this gives you a rapid diffusive mixing of your system. Then, at a much lower rate, you have an asymmetric hopping at rate lambda of L, in which the hopping is allowed only on empty sites. So the minuses go to the left if the site on the left is empty. The pluses go to the right, but only if the site on the right is are empty. And then at an even slower rate, gamma over L square, minuses can become pluses, and pluses can become minuses. If you implement these dynamics, and if you take um, a density which is large enough and a rate of asymmetry which is large enough, you observe motility-induced phase separation. Now, it turns out that because of the way we've scaled the rate of this process, if you do a diffusive scaling of these dynamics, it is exact. And then you can look at the, the harmonic equations that you get, and you get a set of two coupled harmonic equations, which are a bit more complicated than the one I described before. You get that DT rho is D Laplacian rho, stochastic hopping on lattice, diffusion term, that's expected. Then you have this term in magenta, lambda grad M one minus rho, so that's just telling you that if locally you have more pluses, M here is the magnetization, so it's the local number in a big box of the number of plus particles minus the number of minus particles. So you have a bend, if you have a lot of plus particles, things move to the right. If you have a lot of minus particles, things move to the left. And the one minus row is the exclusion. If you look at the dynamics on M, the local magnetization, the difference between pluses and minuses, you've got the same type of terms. In addition, you have this term in blue, minus two gamma M, which tells you that because you have random hopping from plus to minus, if locally you start with more pluses or more minuses, you will relax towards one half, one half. If you make simulations, you get what you have on the bottom left. Microscopic simulations are in red, uh, and you, we average a large number of them. The PDE simulations are in blue. You see that you have an almost perfect agreement. You have a perfect agreement for the density in the dilute and dense regions not a complete agreement in the profile, and this is due to the fact that when we make fluctuations, when we make averages between a number of microscopic simulations, we also have fluctuations. These fluctuations, decay is one over L, but we have finite L, so we have finite fluctuations. Now, we can still solve analytically the phase diagram here. It's a bit more complicated, but we can use the same transform, and we get the phase diagram that we have on the right. As I told you, is lambda which is the asymmetric hopping rate is large enough and the density is rightly set, you have phase separation. Around the red curve, you have a homogeneous region. In between, you have phase separation. The blue line delimits a spinodal region within which homogeneous profiles are linearly unstable. The red line is the parameter-free prediction, uh, analytical prediction for the coexisting densities. 
the red dots are measurements from macroscopic simulations and the black dots measurements from microscopic simulations. And so here you have an, a perfect agreement between macroscopic simulations and this macroscopic theory. So that's the end of the theory of why you have phase separation in self-propelled system in which the interaction between the particles is a quorum sensing interaction. So my speed depends on the density of people like me around me, or my tumbling rate, or my uh, tumbling duration. Now, there is another class of system which has attracted a lot of attention in which you also see motility in use phase separation, which is slightly different. It's systems in which you have several particles with repulsive pairwise forces. Question? Yes? So in the previous model, uh, microscopic model, uh, your parameters does not depend on the density or the occupation of the particles, right? The microscopic so parameters? So it, it does in that the, um, the hopping rate is only allowed on empty sites. Only that, okay. Yeah. yeah, so you can do a generalized version of that in which, so that's the model described here, which has also been looked at by um, Ramin Golestanian and Rodrigo Soto, uh, yes. and by David Inko and co-workers, in which here, you see on this lattice, I allow for more particles. So here my black particles hop to the right, my white particles hop to the left, and I take a hopping rate which decays linearly with the occupancy of the target site. Okay, so if I if I hop on a site which is empty, I hop at rate v naught. If I hop uh, on a site which has n m over two particles, I hop with rate n of uh, v naught over two. And if I try to hop on the site with n max particles, I have nothing. Here you see a simulation of a one million times uh, one thousand times one thousand lattice sites, in which I have a thing here. The maximal occupancy is fourteen. The average occupancy is six and you have a linear decay of this hopping rate with the density of the target site. Every time the time hits a decay, the movie is speed up by a factor 10. You can see that you start to have this um, gradient, this texture of density, and uh, typically the same will be separate, will undergo MIPS, and we can do very large simulation in this, um, this lattice-based model. And at the end of the day, uh, you would get basically, uh, so now you can start to see the coarsening. And this coarsening, by the way, really resemble what you see in an equilibrium um, Oswald ripening simulation. So at this large scale, the microscopic ingredient is different from equilibrium phase separation, but the phenomenology is very similar. Okay. Okay, so here really the, the, the interaction is on the fact that this asymmetric hopping is on empty site. So at the mean field level, if you want, this is a, a V of rho. Okay, so now if we go to this other type of dynamics, so people have looked at uh, self-propelled particles of lattice, in which the self-propulsion here is constant, it's given by this uh, value V, but you have pairwise forces, and here F will be repulsive forces. So now if you imagine that you're running to catch a train, and, you, and the train station is empty, you run fast, if the train station is full and you constantly bump into people, even though the interaction you have with these people when you bump into them is a repulsive interaction, you don't stop to hug, you just bump into each other, on average, most of the collision you have are in front of you, and so this collision will slow you down. So if I look at my speed, ri dot, and I project it an, onto the direction in which I'm trying to go u of theta, I can define an effective density v of rho, and you can see that this function, you can imagine that this function will eff effectively decrease as the density increases. And so this will lead to the same idea that you spend more time in denser regions, that there is this accumulation in dense region and this phase separation, and if you do uh, simulations, you see similar phenomenology as current sensing active particles. So this is starting from uh, homogeneous simulations, uh, systems, that simulations done by Alexandre Solon, and you see that you develop these clusters, and as time goes on, you have a coarsening. So these systems are very large finite size effect. You can see that the, the interface is much rougher than that of the previous slide. You have the same type of coarsening, uh, again, we can do very large, so that happens in 2D and 3D. We can do very large simulation. Here we start 
from a single macroscopically phase separated droplet, you can see the system is enormous. You have 10 million particles in this system. And as time goes on, you see that you have fluctuations. The interface is rough, but essentially the droplet is stable and you will remain uh, in a phase separated system for very, very long times. Now, this system has qualitatively the same physics as that of quorum sensing interactions. It has interesting differences. Again, we know how to write down a hydronic description for this system. But interestingly, where the quorum sensing dynamics, the current was written as minus the gradient of a chemical potential. Here, the current is the divergence of a stress tensor. And so instead of having a chemically potential driven instability, you get an instability which is driven by inhomogeneity of the pressure field. So if you look at this trans tensor and you look at its diagonal component, um, what you have is you can measure a mechanical pressure out of it. And for this system, unlike the one I will describe on Thursday, you have an equation of state for the mechanical pressure. If you look at the expression of the stress tensor, it's typically the sum of two terms. You have P, what we call the direct pressure, PD, which is the same pressure that the that passive particles would have. So if I take a bunch of particles interacting with repulsive forces, they would typically have a mechanical pressure P, which is a function of their density, and you get similar type of correlators for this active system. And in addition, you have a term which we call the active pressure, which is specific to self particles, whose expression is given here on the right, and which basically measure the flux, which is, probably, which is due to the flux of particles across surfaces. So this PD, of, PD in red is basically the pressure which is due to the fact that particles exert forces across interfaces. And if you exert a force across an interface, you transfer momentum through this interface. The one in blue is due to the flux of particles through the interface who carry the active force with them. If you plot this guy, PD in red, as a function of density, you can see it on the bottom left. This is a purely increasing function of the density. And it just tells you that as in a passive system, when you exert forces um, on the particle, you promote a homogeneous state. The fact that the pressure is an increasing function would lead to a stable system. If you look at this active contribution of the pressure in black, at low density, it is increasing because when they increase the density, you have more particles that grow across interfaces. And so they carry with them their, their active force and that's a positive contribution to the flux of momentum. But at high density, the density hinder this flux, and this flux of um, active force when interface goes down as the density increases. Uh, to get the, the, the variations of the pressure with the density, I have to sum these two curves. And when the speed is large enough, I will have in blue or in green this non-monotonous variation of the pressure with the density. Rho dot is essentially the Laplacian of the pressure. And so when this guy is um, non-monotonous, I have a linear instability and I predict uh, phase separation. Again, we can do this generalized thermodynamics. We can predict quantitatively the phase diagram. Interestingly, this system resembles equilibrium systems in that coexisting phases have the same pressure. But you don't have a Maxwell construction. If you look at, the, if you try to to guess the phase diagram, the binodals that are not such that uh, Maxwell construction works, and there is still a very rich physics uh, to be explored in this case. The surface tension, if you compute it as an equilibrium, you find it's negative, and there are many many things that we don't understand. So qualitatively, we have the same physics as for quorum sensing active particles. Interestingly, it's a pressure-driven instability and not a quorum and not a chemical potential-driven instability. We can still build some theory out of it, but we don't understand this case as well as we understand the quorum sensing instability. Okay, that's the end of the stat make part. And now for the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I will discuss applications to bacterial pattern formation. So I'll come back to my um, bacteria, which have been engineered uh, using synthetic biology to have 
the rate alpha and beta depends on the local density of bacterium. Okay, so what happens in this, in this suspension of bacteria is that if I make a suspension of bacteria which is very dilute, they swim fast. If it's very dense, they stop swimming. Then I do the standard uh, microbiology experiment. I take a box of Petri dish. I put bacteria in the center of the Petri dish, and I look at what happens. And this is what happens over 24 hours. I seed my bacteria in the center of my Petri dish. As time goes on, I see the density um, develop. And what you see is the formation of rings uh, of bacteria. So I'm happy. Because something is happening, I would predict motility-induced phase separation. I don't have motility-induced phase, phase separation, but I have patterns. So this is nice, but that's not what I predicted, so I'm surprised. So um, it could be due to the question that was asked earlier by Nupam, that my model is a model in which the speed depends on the density. But my experiment is an experiment in which the tumbling rate and the tumbling duration depend on density. So I can go back to my microscopic models, um, and I work in you know, times and scales of the experiments. So I take a model in which I have uh, speed that depends on density, so which should have MIPS, with E prime of rho negative, and I plot here a system that is typically of milli millimeter um, size, and I run it over a time scale, which is 10 to the 5 persistence time, which is one day. So when I should get MIPS, I get MIPS. Then I do the same thing, but what I do is that now I have my rate beta of rho that goes down as density increases. So my particles spend more time tumbling at high density. Again, I see the same coarsening and the same phase separation. I play with a model in which now I tumble more frequently when the density increases. Again, phase separation. So the many, um, these many ways of slowing down all lead to motility-induced phase separation. Now, one thing that you realize is that to get macroscopic patterns, large patterns of the size seen in the experiments, I need to wait a really long time. Now, this really long time will happen on time scales in which something else is happening in my system, and this something else is population dynamics. So if I describe the dynamics of my colony of a time scale of minutes, then my MIPS description is good. I have a mass conservation equation. I can write down this hydronomic equation, which I've written here in another way, but that's, a, that's the way you get in which you allow both V, alpha, and beta to all depend on um, the density of bacterium. Now, if I want to describe my dynamics over time scales, which are beyond 20 minutes, I have to add to this description division of day and death of bacteria. And the way of doing that is by simply adding a, a logistic term to my um, dynamics. Now, if I do simulations starting from a central inoculum, I see exactly as in the experiments the formation of rings. Okay, so that's nice. This resembles what we see in equilibrium, but the question is why? So a first thing you can do is you could say, well, maybe it's the initial condition which is different. So you go in a homogeneous system and you start from a system with quorum sensing that wants to do to motility induced phase separation. So this will tend to promote a system in which you have a low density and a high density. Now, in the low density, you will have a logistic growth that will give division and that will tend to make density increase. In the high density region, you'll have death and the, system, the bacteria will tend to die. The competition between the two takes your phase separation and arrests it, and it leads so an arrested phase separation in which I don't see the coarsening anymore. Mathematically, that's something I can see by doing linear stability analysis. I take a simple model of MIPS, I do linear stability analysis, I look at the growth rate of a Fourier mode of um, eigenvector Q, I plot the real part of lambda of Q versus Q, and what I find is that the logistic term in red, 
always stabilizes the long wavelengths at Q equals zero, which prevents the coarsening, and I get a typical swift oenberg like type of pattern formation process. Um, in a more physical way, if I look at a gas droplet in a sea of liquid, the typical size of this gas droplet being 2R, and I look at the variation of mass inside this droplet, the flux due to the transport in, in which promotes the phase separation is proportional to the perimeter, so it's scaled as R, while the population dynamics will give a variation of the mass in the droplet which is proportional to R squared, the area, the competition between the two to find a steady state, we select a fixed radius that will be of a given size. That's why you get phase separation. Okay, now that's the game uh, you can play in, in single species colonies, but you can, you can go beyond that. You can take, for instance, two strains, A and B, and you can implement reciprocal motility control. How do you do that? You take bacteria that you tag with red fluorescent protein, which will produce molecules in red that will go and regulate the motility of another strain of bacteria in green. And conversely, the bacteria in green will promote some molecules that will go around and diffuse and control the motility of the bacteria in red. And here, in practice, it's again this cheesy molecule, so we control the tumbling rate. Now what we can do is either we can do enhancement of motility, I speed you up, you speed me up, I can do inhibition, I slow you down, you slow me down, and you can do you no know, frustrated ways, I speed you up, you, you, you slow me down. So this is the setup that we built to look at what happened in this system. Um, we measure both the density of uh, green bacteria and red bacteria independently, and we can superimpose them. We do again this standard experiment on the top right in which you put them at the center and you look at what happens. The snapshot you see on the right, in the middle, is what happens when you have mutual activation of motility. And I will show you a movie. So, on the left, you have the green channel. On the center, the red channel. On the right, a merge of two of them. And you can see that you have formation of rings, and that these rings are in phase opposition. So, you have a demixing between the two strains of bacteria as they produce the pattern. That's when I speed you up, you speed me up. When you have a mutual inhibition of motility, this is what you observe. Uh, as time goes on, again, we form pattern, but this time, the pattern colocalizes. So you have a richer situation than the single case system because mutual activation for single case doesn't do anything. Can we account for it? Yes, again, we can start from a microscopic model of run and tumble particle in which we have density dependent swimming rate. So we have the beta of the population A depends on the density rho B, the beta of the population B depends on density rho A. We do analytically a coarse graining of, um, of these dynamics, and again, we will get generically this, this coupled dense mass conserving um, densities. This guy would promote phase separation, and we can do linear stability analysis of this part. What we find is a you know, more complicated criterion than V prime over V smaller than minus one over V, which I had before, in which we can read um, the linear instability. So if we have, so this, uh, this is the criterion we have for uh, linear instability, and essentially it's beta A prime of rho A times beta B prime of rho A, positive and very large. So we can have it because both beta A prime and beta B prime are positive, that's a mutual activation of the motility, or because beta A prime and beta B prime are negative, that's a mutual inhibition. If we, if we plot now the component of the eigenvector, in the case of mutual activation, the eigenvector is plotted here on the bottom left. If rho A increases, rho B decreases, so the eigenvector tells you that the linear instability tends to make one density increases, the other density decreases locally, so that's the mixing, and it will lead to segregation. On the other hand, if you have mutual inhibition of the motility, then you find that the eigenvectors have components of the same sign, 
which will lead to co-localization. Then again, at longer time scale, you need to implement population growth. So you add these population dynamics terms. And on the bottom, you get result of simulations, which are exactly what you predict in simulations, in, in what you observe in experiments. If you have mutual activation, you have these waves that propagate patterns in the wake. And when you superimpose them, you find phase separation. If you do mutual inhibition of motility, you have these waves that propagates, you form patterns in the wake of the phase of the system, or of the waves, and if you superimpose the patterns, you find that they are co-localized. So to conclude, motility-induced phase separation or pattern formation exists beyond the single case, uh, the single component case. We've worked it out with two species, and what we find is that mutual inhibition gives phase separation with co-localization. Mutual activation gives phase separation with demixing. Again, the population dynamics arrest the growth and select patterns of fixed size, and we, get, uh, we can get analytical predictions that strongly resembles the one in the experiments. With that, I will conclude this talk. I hope I've convinced you that a lot can be achieved using motility control to safe organize SPPs both in silico and in experiments. The theory starts to be well established, but there are many, many open questions. And I would like to thank all my collaborators with whom I've worked uh, through these years, in particular, my Kate, with whom I started to work on that, and Alex Solon, um, who was a very, very gifted uh, PhD student and who unlocked many, many uh, problems. Finally, I will stop with a biased, unfair, restricted, and incomplete uh, literature review both on motility-induced phase separation. Uh, you know, this is, I, I will probably give you the slides so you can keep that afterwards. If you want to read about quorum sensing or pairwise forces, on lattice systems, uh, understand the generalized thermodynamics, so how you build the steady state, and also references at the bottom uh, on pattern formation um, in bacterial colony. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. <laughs>